Hello, everyone. My name is Paloma Diaz, an Associate Director of Programs for Lila's Benson Latin American Studies and Collections. We have partnered today with the UT LBJ School of Public Affairs to organize an event that raises awareness about the need to protect existing food systems. But beyond food security, we are also concerned about food sovereignty, the right of the people to have healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through sustainable practices in the Americas. We have today five experts in these issues. I'm going to invite first the faculty organizer of this discussion, Professor Raj Patel, to introduce these experts. Raj Patel is an award-winning filmmaker and academic. He's a research professor in the LBA School of Public Affairs. He has degrees from the University of Oxford, the London School of Economics and Cornell University. His first book was Staff and Starve, The Hidden Battle for the World Food System. His second book, The Value of Nothing, was a New York Times and international bestseller. Professor Patel, please take over. Paloma, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, so uh, I'm uh, addressing you from the stolen land of the Tonkawa people and uh, the Comanche Empire here in occupied Texas. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's easy here in Austin to pretend that the pandemic is over and that uh, the situation is normal. Uh, but that is and always will be an illusion. Um, and today we're here to discuss uh, the, 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 the intersection between uh, the pandemic and food sovereignty uh, with four of the brightest minds on the planet when it comes to thinking through these issues around uh, food sovereignty. And uh, I, let me just begin by introducing our panelists briefly, uh, that there are longer bios uh, on the, the webpage associated uh, with this talk, but I'm going to be brief so that we can essentially jump in, have about 45 to, to 60 minutes of conversation and then half an hour of Q&A. Um, so we begin uh, with Peter Rossett. Peter Rossett is a professor of agroecology at the Ecosur Advanced Studies Institute in Chiapas, Mexico. He uh, accompanied agroecology processes in La Via Campesina for many years, and he and Miguel Altieri recently published the book uh, Agroecology, Science and Politics. Uh, his research focuses on scaling up peasant agroecology in grassroots social movements. Uh, we're lucky uh, also to be joined uh, from Cusco by Alejandro Almedo, who is the Director of Programs at Andean uh, Amazon Lead of SWIFT Foundation. Uh, he is a recognized indigenous Quechua leader and current member of the Board of Directors of Asoci Asociación Andes of Cusco, Peru, and Seed Change of Ottawa, Canada. He is also Chief Advisor to the Potato Park uh, of Cusco, Peru, and current coordinator of the International Network for Mountain Indigenous People in Pe Peoples, and champion of the global initiative uh, food forever. Alejandro is an agronomist by training and has served on various expert panels for the UN and other bodies and has uh, consulted for national and international organizations. Uh, next, we were lucky enough to be joined by uh, Maria Luisa Mendoza, Maisa, uh, who uh, Dr. Mendoza is uh, has a PhD in human geography from the University of uh, Sao Paulo, USB, and uh, uh, she's a research scholar at the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics at the CUNY Graduate Center in New York, where she joins us from today. Uh, she is co-director of Rede Social de Justicia y Derechos Humanos, the Network for Social Justice and Human Rights. Uh, in Brazil, and editor of the book Human Rights in Brazil, published annually since 2000. Uh, her research includes uh, history and political economy of agriculture, food, land, and water systems, and geopolitical processes of resistance by rural social movements in Brazil and internationally. And she's the author of Economia Politica and Agronegocio, uh, Political Economy of Agribusiness. Um, finally, Sofia Monsal Suarez is the Secretary General of FIAN International. FIAN is an international human rights organization working for the right to food and nutrition. Before turning Secretary General in 2016, she coordinated FIAN's program on land and natural resources for more than 15 years. Uh, this work included field research visits and fact-finding missions, uh, as well as close collaboration with grassroots food producer organizations. Uh, she has extensive advocacy experience in the UN Human Rights System, uh, FAO, and the UN Committee of World Food Security. And she recently joined the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, and she joins us from Bogota. So uh, thank you all four of you for uh, for being here today. Um, and uh, Peter, let, let's just uh, kick off with you. Uh, and if, I mean, if you could just give us a, a, a sort of a punchy answer to the question, well, what has been the impact of COVID on food sovereignty in the areas where you work? 
So I work with peasant and indigenous peoples organizations across Latin America and Mexico and also in other parts of the world. And the pandemic has been like a X-ray of the rural world and, and of rural peoples because it showed us that many rural or most rural communities across Latin America and in fact the world have been almost abandoned uh, by governments since a long time ago and also are crisscrossed by external dependencies. Uh, so there are a lot of weaknesses became visible during the pandemic, but at the same time, a lot of strengths that were previously invisible also became visible. So for example, uh, one, of, one of the dependencies was that rural people had stopped producing all of their food and had become dependent on processed food coming from outside and also had become dependent on inputs like fertilizer and pesticide and seeds. And all of that stopped arriving uh, to rural communities during the pandemic. But on the other hand, they started planting a lot of food crops again on many, many communities in many, many countries, and also started using more agroecological practices since they couldn't get chemicals. They also had become dependent on selling their products to intermediaries from agribusiness company or buyers from agribusiness companies who would normally come and buy. Oh dear. And that's a very unfortunate uh, image to be frozen on, Peter. Um, let's get back to Peter when he unfreezes. Uh, but I, I wonder, uh, uh, and I, I, I worry I might be risking uh, another te technological uh, dip here, but uh, Alejandro, you're joining us uh, from Cusco on a, on a Wi-Fi connection. I, I understand that this may mean that you, you may have to turn your video off. But I, I wonder if I can throw this question to you. We've just heard from Peter that, uh, you know, that, that, that the, the, the COVID was an X-ray with, you know, the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of, of the structure of capitalism revealed. Uh, I, I wonder if, if that sounds familiar to you. Yeah, um, I would say that what Peter was um, <clears throat> telling us is, um, I believe, common to the whole region. Um, However, um, I would like to uh, also underline um, one factor that in my opinion um, is very important. Um, I, as a Quechua uh, person, um, have a heritage which is, uh, um, comes from 10,000 years of agriculture. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, a very sophisticated food system that emerged here and created uh, incredible civilizations in the whole continent. You know, this focus on food that people had uh, from you know, the past and continue to carry to future has been perhaps the source of a response uh, to this crisis, you know, as you know, Peru has been severely battered by, by the pandemic. We rank first globally in per capita deaths, uh, and you know, in in in, in the whole world, and uh, our economy has shrunk um, around, you know, you know, this more like a ten percent more poverty. But all of that, this data comes from cities, you know. Cities have been uh, um, the areas where the food uh, situation became very traumatic. And I'm gonna put you one example. Um, we work uh, with, a, uh, with an association of communities um, that in an area that we call it the Potato Park. We use the potato there as a, an emblematic crop to arrange, to have an spatial arrangement, a territorial focus, of how food sovereignty in, from our pers indigenous perspective should operate. I have a deep relationship with the land, deep and spiritual relationship with, uh, with the land. And through it, you know, continue to recreate healthy food, uh, the food that people uh, <clears throat> decide 
that is the best for their own, uh, you know, cultural and uh, <clears throat> personal needs. So in this, in this environment, when the pandemic hit, you know, people were already, uh, had localized the food system. So they have ac uh, access to food, to the diverse and healthy food, and even had enough to share with people in need, right? So it shows how um, <clears throat> culture plays um, a, a strong um, role in defining this vision of what means sovereignty uh, in terms of uh, you know, the own society uh, and the own heritage. And there's one fact here that's very important. As I said, Peru uh, you know, runs uh, at the top in, in terms of per capita debt. Uh, Cusco has also been hit hard, but in the potato part, we didn't have a single case of COVID, no a single death. This means one thing. Since Fujimori times two decades ago, we've been flooded, as Peter was telling us, with industrialized, highly processed food, which started to change diets in urban populations from Lima to Cusco. And if you see, you know, how this change in diet made Peru uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the country that, high, that also has the high uh, percentage of people with diabetes in less than 20 years, you know? So it created the conditions or the preconditions for, for the uh, pandemic to hit and have the impact it, it had. While in the communities that continue to uh, um, farm, potatoes, quinoas, um, and different types of crops, um, they um, had the type of nutrition that allowed them to have an immune system that's responsive to these types of, uh, you know, crisis, health crisis. So I think um, in analyzing this, uh, this problem, uh, while, this diversity of cases, because there is not only one type of small uh, scale farmers, there is different types, those that are close to the market that were also hit because markets close with uh, lockdowns and, uh, um, and you know, the inability to um, type the, the produce to the cities, those were badly hit, but those that, had traditions and were uh, connected to the market in, in, in not completely connected to the market, those are better off at this moment. And this is a recent data that shows how the rural area, uh, you know, is doing better than in the poor areas of the cities. Thank you, Alejandro. That's, um... Uh, that, that, that's, uh, 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 I mean, first of all, I'm inc incredibly gratified to hear that there have been so few uh, cases uh, in the Parque de la Papa, uh, and uh, you, you've, you've, you've suggested uh, in, in a way echoing what, what Peter was saying, that, that actually um, that there's been uh, an interesting kind of exposure of the ways that in the industrial food system uh, renders vulnerable other parts of the world. I, I wonder if I can uh, turn to Maisa to ask, does, uh, does this sound familiar to you? Does this, uh, how, how has COVID uh, affected the, the, the areas of the world that, that you work in? Yes, uh, in Brazil, what we have seen, of course, is a, a lack of response from the government to deal with the pandemic. We had uh, over 500,000 people dead of COVID. And uh, also the pandemic served as a distraction for the government to increase destruction, environmental destruction. We have seen huge fires in the Amazon, in the Cerrado and Pantanal, which are 
important environmental areas in Brazil, ecological areas. The government has increased its uh, policies and rhetoric to uh, encourage repression against indigenous quilombolas, which are the Afro-Brazilian rural communities and other social movements in the country. So the situation in Brazil is very dramatic in terms of uh, health and environmental policies. At the same time uh, that uh, we have seen this expansion of uh, agribusiness, monocropping commodities, which is important for us to differentiate uh, the production of commodities by agribusiness, it's not about the production of food. So uh, in Brazil and around the world, small farmers produce more than 70% of food for local markets, which is key, like what Alejandro was saying, uh, especially before the vaccine, and also you know, many people don't have access to the vaccine right now. Uh, one important way for us to protect ourselves and for local communities pro to protect themselves was uh, to consume healthy foods. Uh, that's very important for our immune system. Another important factor is that uh, local communities, indigenous communities uh, are the, the most important um, uh, segment uh, of the population that uh, is protecting biodiversity. And uh, not just in Brazil, but around the world, the UN has uh, uh, published several reports about that. So, and uh, we know that uh, for us uh, to deal with the pandemic and not just now, but in the future, we need to protect biodiversity, this is key. So rural communities, indigenous communities have a key role to play uh, because at the same time that all of this was happening, this you know, huge uh, amount of destruction and repression, Local communities are resisting in Brazil. We work very closely with indigenous and uh, quilombolan and peasant communities, and uh, uh, they found new ways of organizing. For example, you know, to to start uh, using social media, we started to help them produce, for example, a podcast series uh, to want to denounce the impact of the expansion of agribusiness and at the same time to promote alternatives, to promote ways, for example, that they have been doing, for example, uh, protecting water sources, protecting their ecological agriculture that they have been practicing for many, many generations, and uh, at the same time, uh, protecting their land rights, their collective uh, land rights. So I think that uh, in order to deal with the food crisis, the ecological crisis and the health crisis, it's very important for us to transform our food systems. Uh, we have seen, you know, that is support for ecological uh, food production, local food production in the global north. But uh, what we have seen is uh, uh, that uh, multinational corporations and local elites in the global south keep expanding this model of monocropping plantations, which is a main cause of climate change and a main cause of the destruction of biodiversity. So we are not going to be able to deal with the health crisis and the ecological crisis if we don't transform our food systems. This is a key element and we need to to build solidarity in order to do that. Thank you, Misa. Um, uh, so, so as as we uh, uh, there's so much there around um, the the solidarities plus the opportunities taken by capital to entrench uh, its its grasp over the food system during this pandemic. And we'll get into into that in just a second. But I, I want to give Sophia a chance to give us uh, her reflections on what you've heard so far, but also, Sophia, what, what, you know, how you've seen COVID pan out uh, across the scope of, of the work that you've been doing with FIAN. Yes, thank you very much, um, Raj, and, and, and hello to everyone. Well, I, I share um, the reflections done by, by, by Peter, Alejandro, and Maisa. Perhaps I would bring some aspects that haven't been mentioned yet. Um, well, for us, the, the COVID crisis has been um, 
very bad in terms of domestic violence and increased load on women on care work because now of course we are all dealing with with um, ill mm, people in the family um, schools were closed down so children need to be at home um, and so on and so forth so it has been uh, really extremely dire on women in, in Latin America statistics say that uh, the loss of jobs was much more uh, affected much um, heavily women uh, than uh, men jobs, and this has not recovered uh, yet. So the impact uh, on women uh, was um, has been a, a, a really a, a very serious um, problem during the COVID crisis. Um, Another reflection that I wanted to bring out is, is the further deregulation of labor laws, um, because this was used, um, of course, as a measure to react uh, to the COVID crisis. And we have seen in Ecuador, Colombia, but also in Guatemala and Brazil, how uh, laws protecting agricultural workers uh, were further, um, I mean, deregulated and all the protections um, or many of the protections uh, were dismantled in order to be more flexible so that, of course, um, companies and employers could be react much more flexible to the, of course, uh, shortage of demand and, 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 of course, all the disruption uh, of, the, of the market. And this was put or, or dumped on workers. Um, Another issue, which is a kind of new thing, uh, and it is an impact that we see, and perhaps we can discuss later on what it means for food sovereignty, is the issue of accessing food through digital platforms. Uh, we were in confinement, um, and of course, um, the, this idea of the supermarkets bringing uh, home uh, food become really widespread uh, very fast in, in, in cities. But what we see is, of course, uh, the emergence of very precarious jobs uh, with lots of violations of, of labor laws because these people are not even um, employees, right? They are um, users of the digital platform. So which is, of course, a very crazy way of exploiting uh, labor. Um, and we have seen that in countries like Colombia or Ecuador, for instance, the people doing these jobs are uh, Venezuelan migrants. Uh, so there is this very common pattern of exploiting uh, migrant labor um, in, in the food system. Um, another issue related to digital platforms is, of course, that small family restaurants or street vendors and, and all these, let's say, actors around, um, around um, which are related to the peasant food uh, right system, let's say, because these small retailing, small family restaurants tend to buy or pro uh, buy their produce uh, in, in local uh, farmers markets. They were sidelined or uh, were really went bankrupt because of the crisis. Um, and we see that those profiting most from these digital platforms and now the selling of food were um, um, of course, people selling ultra processed foods and of course, all the problems that this, uh, this raises now. So this is, of course, a, a, let's say a problematic shift in, in diets right now because it's rather deepening the problem um, and the bias uh, or, or the, the shift towards uh, ultra processed and, and young food. Uh, junk food. Um, and of course, the last problem is that access to food uh, through digital platforms and electronic payments is extremely um, discriminatory to certain groups of, of society. So we can think of elderly people who don't manage all these online platforms. Uh, and still many people don't have access to internet uh, and credit cards um, to do um, the payments. So I would um, highlight um, these issues for the moment, and then we can reflect what, what they mean for food sovereignty. Thank you, Sophia. Um, well, uh, maybe I can use this as a springboard to bring Peter back in. Uh, I hope, uh, Peter, your, your internet connection is a little bit more stable, but maybe, um, what, what, so what we're hearing here is that the you know that COVID is obviously it's not been a uniform uh, in terms of its impact, uh, but it's also the case that there have been some structural changes uh, that now favour capital, uh, uh, 
coming out of this moment. Um, you know, um, uh, here in the United States, for example, we just had a Supreme Court ruling that makes it much harder for uh, union organizers to uh, unionize um, workers on, uh, you know, on 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 uh, large farms, particularly in California, where this this case came up. Um, but we're still seeing, uh, you know, the the ongoing exploitation, particularly of migrant labor, um, of the you know the 1.7 million undocumented workers in the food system in the United States, uh, and of the far larger number of migrant laborers in the United States. That is an ongoing problem, uh, and one that has been made worse by structural changes in the US economy that makes it easier for uh, meat packing facilities and grocery stores to be uh, frontline institutions. Uh, and uh, as Sophia was saying, patriarchy does seem to have become entrenched in this moment. Um, if we are interested in food sovereignty and we understand food sovereignty as an end to all forms of violence against women, then, uh, and if we understand even something as, as basic as food security is absolutely affected by domestic violence, then uh, the entrenching of patriarchy through COVID uh, is a structural shift that moves us away from food sovereignty. And so, uh, Peter, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw it back to you, uh, not only for uh, an overview, but I wonder if you could uh, give us some thoughts on, on, on these sort of structural changes that might make food, uh, food sovereignty a little harder to achieve. You know, I think they're, they're, they're both negative and positive structural changes. What I, what, just to sum up what I was trying to say before, rural communities were abandoned by governments, by the state completely, and also by the private sector. And that meant that they suffered in one sense because they had become dependent on healthcare, on food, on buyers, on markets, on government security against, against uh, criminal gangs, all kinds of things. But then they also discovered that they could actually do a lot of that stuff themselves. They could plant their own food. They could have uh, uh, collective health protocols. They could rediscover traditional medicine. They developed a lot of alternative markets, so including digital platforms by peasant and indigenous peoples organizations all over Latin America to market when, when the, 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 the supermarket buyers stop buying from them. So it cuts both ways. And I, and I, and I think that structurally what we see, have seen is on the one hand, strengthening of very big companies of agribusiness food chains, because a lot of the, as Sophia said, the, the medium and small size restaurants, stores, suppliers, et cetera, were, were driven out of business. And that, that strengthened the, the oligopoly of the giant agribusiness corporations. Yet on the other hand, there was also a strengthening of, of peasant food networks because many times these agribusiness long value chains collapse due to highways being shut down, truckers being in social distance and lockdowns, and people had to go in cities back to local peasant markets and peasants found innovative ways to bring their produce. So we have a strengthening uh, of, the, of the two extremes, of the peasant food system and of the corporate monopoly food system, making the contradictions more clear than ever, I would say. And so uh, the important thing, and, and I'll close with this for now, but maybe come back to it in, in the last round of questions, is that given now that the, the starkness of the two alternatives that have, that have come out of this, that are coming out of this pandemic situation, we need to consider this to be a teachable moment, a pedagogical moment in terms of public opinion and public education about our food system and what ties into that is the all of the hypotheses as to the origin of COVID and the pandemic and previous pandemics over the last 20 years are in one way or another tied to corporate food production and the corporate food system. So it's that system that's causing the pandemics. It's their bad food that makes people obese, have heart disease, cancer, and other things that are cofactors and therefore make people die in the pandemic. They failed to feed a lot of people because their long supply chains collapsed. And peasants showed an remarkable, re remarkable resilience and ability to produce more and to market in different ways. And so it's a teachable moment. What kind, and, and peasants producing healthy food. What kind of a food system do we want? And I'll stop there for now. Okay, Peter. Thank you. Um, uh, my second, let, let me let me uh, mix it up a little bit uh, and uh, uh, bring you in here uh, because uh, you know, Peter's painting a picture of how you know we've got the sort of more polarized uh, and therefore more, more visibly distinct uh, elements of the food system, and there isn't a country in the world where that's much you know much more sort of visible than than Brazil. But I, I wonder if if 
your, um, I mean, if, if you're seeing the balance of forces shifting uh, towards capital right now, particularly under Bolsonaro? Yes, that's for sure. Uh, under Bolsonaro, uh, that is, uh, of course, he is giving the green light for the expansion of agribusiness, which is the main cause of the fires and the environmental destruction that we have seen in Brazil that is increasing in recent years because of his policies and his rhetoric. At the same time, uh, in terms of uh, structural changes, what we have seen in the last two decades is that uh, land, farmland has become a target for financial speculation, especially after the collapse of the housing market in the US. Uh, financial corporations, especially pension funds, for example, TAA, uh, which is a, a pension fund uh, based in the US, but that also receives funds from other pension funds from Europe and from Canada, and some endowment funds, for example, the Harvard University Endowment Fund. Uh, these are huge corporations, financial corporations that started to target farmland as a new asset. So what we have seen uh, more recently is this, uh, that is a, a growing dispute and land has become has become a center of these geopolitical disputes for land and natural resources. And uh, what is financing this process of expanding agribusiness is this financial capital that uh, of these corporations that are buying land in Brazil, in the US and in other parts of the world as well. So uh, because after the, the, the economic crisis of 2008, many Brazilian uh, business corporations went bankrupt and now because of this you know, financial capital and speculation with uh, farmland, they are expanding production again. But there is a disconnection between production of agricultural commodities and control over land. Because after the economic crisis, the price of uh, agricultural commodities started to decrease in international markets, but the price of land continued to increase. So the main goal of these corporations, uh, agribusiness corporations and financial corporations is control over land. But in order to justify the increase price of land and control over land, they then promote monocropping of agricultural commodities that are a main cause of climate change and the destruction of uh, biodiversity, which of course, you know, have a major impact on health and, and are connected with the, with the pandemic. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's important for us to understand these processes because this is again, a new way of looking at it. It's, an, it, it's the new colonial view, for example, these corporations uh, see Brazil as empty space, as if it was all empty space. But there are, of course, hundreds and you know, thousands of uh, local communities, peasant communities, indigenous uh, communities that have been living in this land for many generations. So there is a process of huge process of land grabbing uh, connected to speculation with farmland. And that, of course, has a huge effect on food production because these are these communities are the ones uh, that produce healthy food for local markets thank you Maisa. um for you know i i think it that's such a salutary reminder that uh, the you know the, the the stock market boom that happened certainly through uh, you know the, the the pandemic here in the United States relied on the circulation of capital uh, and the you know the, the reinvestment of that capital through flows of you know, that involved appropriation far outside the United States and which turns farmers into uh, you know reliable producers of yield for investors. Uh, and th those, uh, you know, those processes absolutely implicate the United States. Uh, even uh, those of us in the academy who like to think that our pensions are doing nothing but good through TIAA uh, are, uh, in fact, uh, complicit in this in, in this process of destruction. And, and I wonder, Sophia, whether uh, you, you can also. I mean, you know, we, we've we've heard about uh, the, the the financial shifts. We've heard about the corporate power shifts. Um, what what other shifts make food sovereignty harder now? Well, I think authoritarianism and, and fascism uh, 
are making things very difficult. Um, you know, I mean, in Brazil, we lost all the achievements in terms of democratizing decision making. I mean, the local policy the food councils, right up to the national the consea. Um, this is this is lost. It was closed down, and in just in two years, we see an enormous climb of people hungry in Brazil, right? Uh, it, this is not only in, in the food area, in, in environmental governance, we see exactly the same thing and we are in exactly the same mess as Maisa was uh, telling about the fires and all of that. So, and I see here it, in Colombia, I mean, of course, um, we got the, the peace accords. Uh, it was, you know, after so many years of war, at last, like uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, uh, but of course, it was it, we, we we need to go to very difficult issues, like for instance, the extreme concentration of land in Colombia, and of course, the peace agreements had a, a, the first a peace accord. The first one is about uh, uh, some sort of um, it is not uh, really agrarian reform. Uh, I think we have to recall that it, it is a very very modest, a little bit like in Guatemala, uh, kind of at least um, formalizing some of the lands of peasants, of course, reservas campesinas, an extremely important, uh, of course, uh, form of, of protecting the territory of peasants and of course, Afro-Colombian territories and indigenous peoples territories and so on and so forth. But it is not a radical uh, <laughs> redistribution of, of the pri private latifundia in Colombia. Uh, so, but at least, um, but all this is destroyed. It has been destroyed uh, by the existing government. Right, and now they are threatening to bring uh, the paramilitary war, which has been watched a uh, voyage in rural areas for several decades, to cities. I mean, people in Cali today speak about uh, Cali will become some sort of Aleppo in Syria. You know, so it's going to be war in cities in Colombia. This is this is the nightmare that people are. I think it could could happen, and it is it, it is just terrible the way. The government and, and and really paramilitary groups in in cities like Cali are just killing people on in the open, you know. Uh, so um, I really think that this authoritarian shift, which is not only in countries like Brazil or Colombia, um, but in other places, of course, uh, it's it's making uh, th things extremely extremely difficult. And in terms of food sovereignty. Yes, I, I agree with Peter that uh, we see uh, uh, the, the peasant agriculture and, and all as a solution. For sure, it's now more clear than ever. But the dismantling of public policies, you know, bridging the non-producers in our societies, right? Uh, giving access to that food, because if we want to scale it, uh, if you think of programs like the Brazilian uh, program for public school meals, you know, and how it, it was connected uh, to agriculture, peasant agriculture, and so on and so forth. So we need this, this kind of, I don't know how to call them, bridges or, you know, the, this type of public policies. And they are, they are, they are being dismantled as we speak, because the, the structural problems remain like financialization uh, of nature now, you know, and now we are expanding from agribusiness into the whole new world of green capitalism on carbon offsetting in soils and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, it, it, is, uh, it is, I think, uh, still I, 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 I don't see how we are going to face these things. Uh, I know that this is the way and we are trying to go that way. And I think for me, it's very hopeful to see these young people, the young kids in Cali, for instance, on what it is called in Colombia, the, the first line, right? Um, blocking, um, I, I mean, the people doing the strike and blocking roads and so on and so forth. We have brought their voices to the Human Rights Council in Geneva to announce what is going on in Colombia. And it was so encouraging to see these very young kids saying, as the first demand, what they want, food sovereignty. It's very clear for them. You know, so therefore, I, as Peter, I also see a mixed picture because I think, for instance, with food sovereignty in a country like Colombia, we have now permeated society and it is in the imagination of these new generations, which are facing 
uh, the fascists running this country, you know? So it is, it is I think, a very, very important development. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, that's, the, you know, I, I didn't know that, that food sovereignty was uh, the, uh, the, the first demand and that, that is a, a source of hope. And we will be getting to sources of hope. We're, we're getting a few questions in um, from, uh, from our Facebook uh, broadcast. And if, if you have additional questions, please do uh, add them. But I, I want to turn now to Alejandro because uh, for, you know, I, I think among us, Alejandro has been most, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it has, has experienced the, the rise of authoritarianism uh, and, uh, and, and has lived through what authoritarian governments do to indigenous communities very, very directly. And I wonder, Alejandro, um, if you might be able to, to bridge us from this discussion of the structural shifts that militate against food sovereignty to where you see perhaps spaces of hope? Well, um, first, and Alejandro, you, you may need firstly, to turn off um, your, your video. Uh, the, the bandwidth is, is a little constrained. I mean, your, your video. Uh, okay. Well, um, during the pandemic um, in Peru, I think we've seen also similar trends um, <clears throat> the previous speakers have um, mentioned. There's a, a couple of, um, I think, points that are important to highlight here. One is how you know, restrictions were uh, applied to, uh, you know, to workers and to a small business, uh, except you know, big business like um, <clears throat> you know industrial farming and agro, <clears throat> you know uh, food exports and mining. You know mining grew um, around thirteen percent last year. Um, <clears throat> also exports in terms of commodities um, from the um, agricultural sector, which is mostly based in the coastal area, um, also grew exponentially, though, um, you know, wages um, have came down. Now, um, there's also another element in Peru that's very important, which is reverse migrations from cities to the rural areas. As I had mentioned before, in rural areas, uh, communities have maintained spaces where, you know, water, access to food, a healthy food, a space for, a, 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 um, you know, healthy living um, were um, actually available. While in the cities, the concentration of people made uh, <clears throat> the, the pandemic to uh, spread more rapidly. So with the lockdown, you see people uh, that used to live by the day walking by weeks to go back to the communities of origin. So we've seen a high influx of people returning to the old communities because in those communities they can find food they can, they can find <clears throat> uh, institutions that uh, provide support. And this is not the government, but the own, the, you know, the communities, the traditional institutions and norms that uh, you know, uh, revive and became stronger during the pandemic. And it is these communities that establish their own lockdowns, their own rules and made possible to minimize of you know the spread of the uh, uh, of the disease, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, um, you know um, the hope that we see is that <clears throat> food sharing became very important, and this is very very old. Um, uh, <clears throat> A very cherished value of uh, indigenous peoples here. Food commons, you know, assumes that sharing food 
can transform and also creates um, the space for dialogue and conversation and therefore for uh, <clears throat> you know uh, strengthening a democratic process within uh, rural communities so this has been also source of inspiration uh, during the height of the pandemic for instance the potato park um, donated and they themselves uh, uh, <clears throat> brought uh, a couple of tons potatoes to people that were without food in the cities because of the lockdown. They were stranded, but also to, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> shelter for battered women and to uh, <clears throat> elder, um, uh, um, you know, um, places where the elder would um, actually having problems accessing food. So. This type of solidarity and this type of food system with values became, uh, you know, something that um, started to inspire other communities, and we see in sense how communities from Cusco would send food to communities far away in Lima or in Arequipa, which are cities in the coastal area. So I think this creates a narrative that is very powerful and that refashions this way we see, you know, um, the governance of food in terms of transactions that are only based on economy. And here, I think there's also one element that we don't usually see is that the prevalence of no monetary systems within the rural economy, uh, bartering, uh, other types of transactions, which you know, have supported the community economically, while we think that because that's not accounted, uh, because that it's not measured in terms of monetary uh, <clears throat> means, then it doesn't um, you know, show within the different types of analysis of the economical impacts that we have. And that's the reason why we believe that the communities that might are in this mixed system, economical system, which is strongly based in, in, in agriculture and their food system, where they know where, when to use monetary system for their exchanges, when they use no monetary system for the transactions. And I think this revival, along with uh, a food system with values, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's creating the principles for us to, to keep working in, in, in a different type of food sovereignty here. Yeah. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, and uh, in fact, th 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 this seems to be uh, to, to respond rather directly to a concern that Sofia had around um, the the links between rural and urban. Um, if the I mean the, the the mark of hope here appears to be that if the state can't do it. Uh, there are nonetheless mechanisms through which food may be, uh, you know, donated and may be, uh, may circulate in a solidarity economy rather than in a monetary one uh, from rural to urban areas. I, I wonder whether, Sophia, uh, that sounds right and whether you see other areas of hope. I oh, know, I totally agree with Alejandro. Uh, I think uh, in Brazil, the donations of MST and M MPA uh, to different types of uh, people's kitchens and so on and so forth are huge. We are talking about thousands of tons of food donated. Now, these are complex arrangements. They are, of course, hooking on some public policies which are still operating somehow. It's, a, it's of course, a mosaic of many different solutions, but it is just massive. Um, so therefore, I, I, I totally agree. To come back to the example of Colombia, the people on on the strike on the on the on the streets in in places like uh, Cali have come together in order to sustain the strike. They had to set up people's kitchen in the middle of the roads, you know, and 
these young people are saying, now I'm eating better than before the strike because of the people's kitchen, because of this, what Alejandro was saying, this sense of solidarity and coming together and around food. So I think this is a very extreme important shift. And in the case of, of Brazil, they have even managed to bring agroecological produce to people rendered unemployed in big cities and so on and so forth. You know, connecting agroecological produce to non, uh, I mean, to, to um, jobless people and people in slums in cities, this is a major achievement because so far we have been, I mean, the, the mainstream preoccupation is that agroecology produce finds enough, enough consumers, but here we are talking about connecting really the solidarity bonds and, and for a transformatory project uh, of, of the food system. So I think the example, and examples go on. I mean, in Ecuador is the same, very similar to what Alejandro is saying, uh, recovering very old traditions, also Kichwa traditions of exchange, in Colombia has been the same. I mean, the, the Minga bringing food to the strike people. So I think this is spreading all over the country, all over the continent, sorry, also in other continents and the Philippines or in South Africa, you find similar examples. But what our challenge now is to see how to strengthen these processes, these communal institutions, if you want, is a new type of, it's not the public, it is a really a truly communal space, but how does it relate to the public and so on and so forth? So that would be, I think, um, the, the, the questions for the future. Thank you, Sophia. Um, uh, Peter, uh, you've, I mean, you, 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 you've heard uh, a lot here about the possibilities of solidarity. What, what, what are you seeing that gives you hope emerging out of this beyond the protest movements? Um, uh, you know, if, if you can give us a, a well, absolutely the solidarity, picking up picking up on the solidarity. Peasant organizations and indigenous peoples organizations around the world have been, uh, as as Sofia and Alejandro said, bringing food to homeless people, bringing food to unemployed people, bringing food to slum dwellers. Have engaged in barter in their regions to make up for the disappearance of the cash economy with lockdowns. So uh, as Alejandro said, there is, a, there is a, a food system with values that's become more evident to more people. And I think, and I, I go back to the teachable moment. I think all of us who are uh, uh, militants, activists in the struggle around the food system, ranging from peasant organizations to homeless people's organizations, to farm worker organizations, uh, we have to seize this moment and uh, because the the facts are 100 percent on our side uh, how 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 the dominant food system causes pandemics how it makes us die in pandemics how it can't feed us in pandemics how pandemics are going to be ever more com common given that structure how governments need to ban for example large-scale uh, intensive production of animals that are confined uh, because this is one of the sources of pandemics and, and how, how we have this other food economy that's based on solidarity, that's based on, on healthy food, that's based on traditional knowledge, that's based on agroecology. Uh, and, and, and so we, we, the collective we, have to seize the moment. Um, it's, it's, it's essentially now or never, we're never gonna have a more teachable moment about the food system than, than with the pandemic. And I think one, one of the entry points is how the, the, the global meat complex, and I'm not pushing vegetarianism, I'm actually pushing peasant raised uh, animal protein, but how the global meat corporate complex uh, uh, confines animals, feeds them antibiotics, generates viruses, generates antibiotic resistant bacterial diseases and makes us sick and encroaches on the forest through livestock feed plantations that pushes wildlife into contact with human populations. They fund the gain of function research that possibly if there was a lab escape would have come from that. Uh, they fund, uh, they, 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 they are responsible for all of the different aspects of, of, of what we're facing right now. So it's the time. And that actually gives, gives me hope because we have this very teachable moment. Uh, and Peter, uh, before we get to my seat, uh, Peter, you, you uh, mentioned in our uh, participants chat here, uh, a country where things had been uh, moving towards uh, more sustainability. And you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in Cuba? 
Well, I would say a couple of things. One, Cuba is a, is a world-class example of successfully multiplying peasant production of agroecological food, uh, driven by the National Peasant Organization of Cuba called the NAP, which is part of the Acampesina International, which has used peasant to peasant recovery and, and exchange of knowledge to build a, a, a very large proportion of national food production that's done on an agroecological basis. But Cuba is also one of the countries that, that showed us more humane and effective ways of managing lockdowns. For example, Cuba did selective, has been doing selective lockdowns wherever there's an outbreak and bringing food to people in their homes and guaranteeing them their salary. Because one of the things we see in many countries, whether it's Mexico or the United States or Brazil, is that uh, governments declare lockdowns essentially to protect urban populations from contamination, but they don't make it possible for poor people to stay at home because poor people are, are not either they're getting no government assistance or the emergency assistance that they're getting is a joke. And so therefore they have to continue to work and they have to go out even when there's a lockdown. But countries like Cuba, like Venezuela, guaranteed people's salaries and therefore make it possible for people to stay at home and stay safe when there's a, when there's a lockdown. And so uh, there's a, there, there, there are some examples of governments that have managed it well, although by and large governments have managed it terribly. Uh, the urban poor have suffered, people of color have suffered, women have suffered. They've done nothing about the increase in domestic violence and they completely abandoned rural, the rural world completely. Indigenous peoples, communities, Afro-descendant communities, peasant communities, which in a contradictory way also allowed those communities to rediscover some of their strengths. I mean, all of these things are double-edged swords out of, out of bad things sometimes come good things, but we should look at those governments that have uh, managed this in a, in a better way than others. Thank you, Peter. Um, Misa, what, what are you seeing that, that uh, on balance makes you think that structurally we're, we're, that there's the possibility of something uh, good coming out of this? As I think uh, Sophia, Alejandro, and Peter already mentioned many of very important points, I would say that uh, given the urgency of the crisis we face right now, uh, we see, I, I also see this moment, this opportunity to connect all these dots, all these different issues, and, uh, you know, build, increase solidarity and uh, also highlight the importance of these local communities to protect the land, protect natural resources, and uh, their local, local knowledge of uh, producing healthy food. Sophia gave an important example of the, how the MST was able to share you know, so much food with uh, people in need in Brazil. Uh, so how people find, you know, ways of, uh, new ways of building solidarity is very important. The examples that Alejandro gave uh, also are happening in Brazil. For example, we also have seen um, migration of uh, people who had been displaced from the land, uh, who were in urban areas going back to the land, returning to rural areas. Uh, we have seen also an important role of youth and women organizing in rural communities. And uh, usually uh, something that you said, Raj, that is important, uh, agribusiness claims in Brazil and in other parts of the world to represent about 40% of the GDP. But the thing is that all, th this is all output that doesn't count all the unpaid debts, all the financial debts that is causing, and of course the environmental destruction. At the same time, what we have seen in local communities, uh, especially the agriculture that is done by women, that is totally invisible many times from official data. That is not counted anywhere. For example, even you know if the census, the agricultural census uh, goes to a, a, a rural community in Brazil, they usually count the production that is put in the market, but the, the production for subsistence that is not just for the, that community, but the, the food that is shared with other communities in the region and in uh, small towns in rural areas, this is crucial 
for food sovereignty. And this is not uh, counted anywhere. So it's you know, similarly to uh, uh, women's labor that is not counted anywhere. So I think that uh, it's very important to become aware of that. Uh, you know, all these creative ways in which rural communities have been uh, uh, living for many generations and also, you know, the, uh, how they are able to now, for example, uh, uh, to, uh, to re, uh, rebuild water sources that had been destroyed before, uh, to rebuild uh, uh, medicinal uh, plants, uh, so, uh, um, so how, how, how can we see that and support that? Uh, because many times, you know, this is invisible. And uh, so I think we need to, uh, to highlight this and to, to understand that this is crucial, that uh, these communities, we're not just talking about isolated communities in rural areas in Brazil, Colombia, or Peru because these communities are protecting the land and uh, what they are doing is crucial uh, for climate change to prevent the effects of climate change that of course uh, have impacts all over the continent and internationally as well. So I think it's an important uh, moment to build solidarity and to make uh, these communities visible and their key role in building food sovereignty. Thank you, Maisa. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for all, all four of your uh, remarks here, and I, I, we're getting some terrific questions uh, in the comments um, and uh, and uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, if you do have questions, please do post them there. Um, I, I wonder if I can synthesize a, a couple of them uh, by telling a, a, just a, a, a little anecdote from some of my research in sub-Saharan Africa in 2008, after the uh, after the crisis. Uh, there was a great deal of urban rural migration, uh, usually men who had been uh, breadwinners in cities started to come back uh, to the farm uh, and uh, sometimes were displacing women's, uh, women who had been running the farm uh, and their return home coincided with uh, investment from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in fertilizer subsidies and in a kind of agriculture uh, that hooked returning uh, you know, uh, uh, migrants and again, usually male migrants into a commodity production system as part of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Um, now, uh, you know, and, and the Gates Foundation said, yes, well, we're, we're very sorry about that, that we're, you know, we're very excited, yeah, although this does seem to have negatively impacted women, it does seem to have done a great deal for the uptake of fertilizer and for industrial agriculture, and so they were quite pleased. Now, uh, I, uh, I, I throw that out as, as an anecdote now, because um, uh, while we've just ended on uh, the, the the possible upside of all of this, the fact remains that this is this sometimes feels like a billionaire's world in which we merely uh, are given permission to live. And one of the questions we've been uh, we've been offered is uh, around the power of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, not just in terms of the UN Food Systems Summit, but how is it that uh, you know these large philanthropic capitalists? Uh, may prejudice our possibilities of food sovereignty coming out of COVID. I, I wonder if I can pose that to y'all before asking the rural urban migration question. Uh, but any takers for uh, taking down uh, our comrades at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Unmute yours. Thank you, Peter. Where are you? Disappeared off my screen. Um, Here I am. There we are. Do you hear me? No. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes, but for people who don't know what the Bill and Gates, Melinda Gates Foundation has been doing, it's been trying to uh, bring the complete agribusiness service network to previously underserved areas of the world, such as rural Africa. And that means they've been investing and in supporting the creation of, of networks of local pesticide and fertilizer dealers and commercial seed dealers, saying that they're, that they're that these private sector intermediaries provide a, a necessary service for peasants and that's the way to boost 
uh, food production, for example, in Africa, but it's also a very good way to boost sales of, of uh, GMO seeds and fertilizers and pesticides made by companies like Bayer Monsanto and Chem China and other, and other giants, which bought Syngenta, other giant companies around the world, to the detriment of local knowledge, lo local food systems, and towards the indebtedness of small farmers, because that model creates the debt trap, which leads to family farmers and, and peasants losing their land over time. So it's a very negative role that they're taking. And, and ironically, it's called philanthropy, but it, it fits very nicely with some of their, now they're getting divorced, but their former, the former couple's personal investments in the very same companies who gain to it, who, who, who stand to expand their markets for their products because the philanthropy is funding this network of sales out, outlets for them. So they're able to no, not pay any taxes on their profits from Microsoft because they create a foundation and they use the foundation to create the conditions for their personal investments to be more profitable. So it's a very evil thing around this industrial corporate philanthropy complex, billionaire philanthropy complex and it runs absolutely counter to everything we've been talking about today in terms of building food sovereignty and it needs to be denounced and it needs to be fought against. Over. Sophia, uh, I saw your hand uh, up there a second ago. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with Peter and perhaps one of the things that we are seeing is, is a strong reaction from the global side of things. Um, coming to what's going on in the on the ground and, and, and what we have somehow outlined here, because um, I think they're very nervous. They know that uh, this industrial food system is just totally bankrupt. Um, so they are nervous and they are trying to uh, to to regain terrain, capturing our own language, capturing probably parts of agroecology, capturing the human rights discourse. Uh, for sure, um, and trying to fix it with um, technology and digitalization will fix it all. And I think the merging of the environmental climate green capitalism agenda uh, with the food and agricultural agenda is what we will be seeing. And it is very authoritarian because again, it is closing the few democratic spaces we had at global level to discuss and advance uh, the food sovereignty agenda. And it's basically going to close it uh, down. So what we will see will be, of course, not formally, these places will remain, but we will be completely empty of any democratic meaning. And we will see a mushrooming um, and uh, an and overcrowding of coalitions of actions uh, with all sorts of um, false solutions um, to the problems that we have uh, set here. So I think uh, this is this is the scenario. It's not just the Gates Foundation, it's, it's the complex as Peter was saying. Um, and it is of course also the coalition of northern countries, the European Union and, 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 and agro-exporting countries, which are very much okay uh, with that scenario. Uh, thank you, Sofia. Alejandro. Yeah, um, just I want to follow up on, on, on the last comment um, from Sofia. And I, I think this um, marrying between, uh, you know, the uh, big uh, um, environmental NGOs, like um, those that um, advance uh, fortress uh, conservation or militarized types of protected areas, and that are moving into promoting the food system uh, or different types of, you know, within the, 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 the formal food system, um, are trying to carve a space to bring that paradigm. Uh, therefore, you know, uh, as Sofia has mentioned, uh, the car, uh, <clears throat> pricing approaches uh, and the commodification or, and land grabbing, commodification of seeds and land grabbing, it's becoming like a, um, you know, a big worry. And um, in this, um, I would also would like to highlight another aspect of this problem, which is um, very much um, linked to, you know, the structural of racism and uh, which is, you know, this idea of the white savior industrial complex. 
where you have these experts um, that come from big institutions with defined solutions that are based on science and evidence, uh, I mean, scientific evidence, and uh, <clears throat> you know, enforce those types of, of visions on communities that are still hold millenary traditions, uh, you know, where there is an epistemic diversity of knowledge systems that are still very much functioning and responding uh, in a different way. And I think uh, <clears throat> while we have these, uh, these approaches, we have also, uh, I mean, these tech uh, technocratic approaches, um, those came with this uh, uh, very heavily loaded uh, with its uh, racist approach of the white savior. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. I, and I, I think that that's, you know, the, 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 that, that idea of uh, policing who it is that can be the bearer of knowledge and innovation and uh, science is precisely what it is that the, the UN Food Summit seem, seems to be doing in its uh, co-optation of agroecology. And I, I, uh, I do think that we, we, should, we should talk about that, but we should also just talk, talk uh, about this, the, the, the sort of rural urban uh, moment here. A, a few people have been asking the question, how do we support uh, this, you know, the, the, the sort of transition as people leave the cities for rural er areas? How do we uh, how do we get folk to stay, whether in Peru or elsewhere? Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if we can answer is it Sylvia uh, Sarapura's question of how it is that we can, you know, th that we can turn this teachable moment into a policy moment. Uh, well, I can I can say one thing that uh, uh, indigenous organizations are demanding in Brazil. One proposal is uh, to boycott agricultural commodities from Brazil, uh, especially for commodities, beef, timber, sugar, and soy, because these are a main cause of environmental destruction. And this is the only way to pressure the Brazilian government. Of course, it's very difficult to organize an individual boycott of these commodities because they're used in many processed foods as well. Uh, but for example, in terms of policy, uh, we can pressure uh, the US government and the European Union, for example, on trade policy uh, to establish uh, tariffs, higher tariffs for commodities, agric agricultural commodities from Brazil. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's possible uh, to work with, uh, for example, Congress members around the, the Green New Deal, uh, also to look at the role of uh, multinational corporations, U.S. corporations in the global south, because uh, so there are interesting proposals, for example, to limit foreign ownership of farmland in the U.S. as part of the Green New Deal, but how about the role of US corporations, financial corporations, and agribusiness corporations in other countries? So I think we need to look at this from an international pers perspective uh, in terms of food policy and environmental policy. Thank you, Maisa. Alejandro, you, you're going to come in on the, the question of uh, how to persuade folk to stay in rural areas. I think um, it did what um, the pandemic has shown is that if you have these spaces that are healthy, where you have the possibility not only to grow healthy food and have social relations in a way that, um, you know, uh, the the key or the core principles of uh, indigenous traditions, for instance, in this part of the globe, continues to flourish, solidarity, reciprocity, balance. You know, there's more a more um, uh, interest uh, to have those spaces um, uh, uh, to be recognized uh, and put into public policy. Um, 
what happened in Peru last year was uh, somewhat interesting that in the midst of the pandemic, we have an extension of the more moratorium uh, uh, <clears throat> for another 15 years, but also the implementation of uh, some laws that allow communities to come together and form what's called agrobiodiversity zones, which are self-organized type of territorial um, um, spaces managed with a, with a territorial vision where the, <clears throat> the um, local uh, needs and the specific um, uh, challenges that people have and be respond uh, from, uh, you know, um, bottom up rather than follow up national policies that in majority of uh, situations are, you know, doesn't reflect those particularities of these places. So um, while uh, we have uh, a society that's more interested in, in food traditions and gastronomy, um, where that's based on our culinary uh, heritage and of course on native crops, uh, I think that also creates the possibility that um, those areas can be linked to urban areas so that, um, you know, a specific, uh, you know, more um, uh, the types of uh, jobs and the types of occupations that uh, rural areas need can be created. And we hope that this new administration coming into Peru, uh, which is uh, actually, um, you know, um, focusing on, on a territorial approach to food production uh, can make those changes. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, we've got another uh, question from, uh, from Marcos uh, Ezequiel Filardi, who's, who's asking about um, genetically modified crops in Argentina. I mean, you know, we're, it, the, the idea of agro-biodiversity zones is very appealing. And yet it, it, it appears that Argentina has just given commercial authorization for the first GMO wheat, uh, supposedly resistant to drought and tolerant to glyphosate. Uh, so what can we do about that? And what are the, you know, what are the perspectives for world food sovereignty given the, you know, the, the, the ongoing success uh, of these agrochemical corporations to, to win over uh, state authorities? Do we wanna take that on? No one's, no one's going to just throw down for, for communist revolution? Well, I mean, I think obviously we're opposed to GMO crops, whether, whether we're talking about wheat or tomatoes or maize or, or any others. The, and the arguments are, are, are pretty much the same. Uh, they, they lead to increased use of herbicide and other, and other pesticides. They uh, are, are single or a small number of varieties that replace a large number of locally adapted varieties and therefore erode the genetic basis for continued agricultural production in different parts of the world. They concentrate profit share in the hands of a, of a tiny number of multinational corporations. It's very unfortunate that the, that the return of the supposedly progressive government in Argentina has not affected their position on agricultural technology, they, although they did just create a, pass a law for agroecology, but at the same time, they're approving GMOs. And in terms of the, of the Global Food Summit, they're supporting the worst positions of the United States and China in terms of excluding civil society and pushing the corporate agenda. So we have some major, cor major contradictions with some of these supposedly uh, progressive governments that uh, have been unable to break their their enslavement to capital and to multinational corporations and Bayer Monsanto and other Cargill and other companies like that. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, as we uh, sort of round the corner, there's a, just a quick question from Donya uh, Dawidar, who asks, uh, do we have any evidence that minorities or communities that preserve their own food regime and culture have been less vulnerable uh, within this pandemic? Now, Alejandro gave us a fantastic example of uh, the Parque de la Papa. Are, are there any others um, that we, we can throw into the mix here? 
but here where I live in Chiapas, Mexico, those those communities that that are more self-sufficient and that self-government govern have had less problems with COVID, less infection, and more ability to implement their own social distancing, lockdowns, health protocols. Uh, collect, collective care uh, of, of people. And so definitely, I would say it's a tendency around the world that uh, the, mo the more self-sufficient and self-governed communities have been, the, the, the better off they've been during the, the pandemic. Yeah, I think this is, uh, uh, it would be um, important to, uh, to do a study that shows um, this correlation. And um, um, I think this evidence will will support um, um, you know um, uh, this vision of uh, agriculture or food systems with with values. Um, and uh, uh, here in 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 the southern part of Peru, um, that's the case. And I can I can name like um, ten, you know. Or twenty communities that um, um, you know also didn't have any uh, <clears throat> COVID case or any uh, fatality or any death. Um, but I put the example of the potato part because um, of their own um, approach towards um, you know how you have to show that through solidarity. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, now, as we uh, approach the end of this discussion, I mean, th th it's been very interesting to see this, th you know, th th there, there is this tension that uh, sometimes the only thing that's uh, worse than not having government attention is having it. Uh, and uh, and and we're, we're in this sort of moment of uh, uh, the resurgence of discussions around things like the Green New Deal. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in many ways, the, the discussions around the, the kind of post-pandemic uh, policy towards land and food systems and climate change uh, go uh, you know go against one another here in the United States uh, the, you know, the the sort of watered down version of the Green New Deal pays very little attention to uh, urban uh, to, to, to the food system um, and essentially seems to be a license for the U.S. to carry on consuming as usual uh, and you know speaks nothing of reparations or of trade policy uh, through which the United States um, generalizes its ills uh, across the world. So I, I wonder um, if there is a, a discussion of uh, a more sustainable kind of policy that lifts us and you know, that bends us more towards food sovereignty, towards agroecology, away from uh, the worst positions in the US food system. What y'all would, you know, if, if, in, if you have a closing two minutes, um, what kinds of policies ought we to be looking out for and militating for uh, as we imagine the the post pandemic world leaning towards a, a future of food sovereignty, and I'll you know I, 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 I maybe Sophia you, you've not had a chance to to, to to pitch in, so maybe I can throw that to you first. Okay, I will start with the big ones, and I think is the financialized nature. So we have to completely delink uh, the land and territories through this. Uh, circuits of, of global capital and probably we need to call out for a global agrarian reform because the latifundia today I mean there are global landlords today which are the funds that BlackRock and, and, and many other funds that Maisa was referring to or Wilmar plantations three million hectares and probably we need to include here as Alejandro was recalling us um, some of the um, conservationist NGOs which are controlling also several million hectares in the world so these could be the targets of our global agrarian reform. And we start with that. All lands controlled by in foreign investors will be returned to the, their community. So something like this, I think we could um, start with. And I think um, we need to pay a lots of attention to the issues of, 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 of taxes um, and debt. I mean, we need to break, I mean, to to, to to stop uh, the the tax heavens, you know, and this whole shadow system of um, finances, which is out, out there, uh, there is some movement in terms of now taxing transnational corporations. Fifteen percent was for sure a kind of um, 
legalizing uh, the tax havens option. So this is not good, of course. So, but apparently um, um, discussions for getting this um, percentage up are, are there. So this, I think it is important because we need also fiscal space uh, to do, um, uh, I mean, to stop uh, austerity measures and to uh, take seriously, um, I mean, do serious um, social policy, whether in education uh, or, or in energy, we need, um, I think, to um, reclaim and, 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 and take again, perhaps not only to the public space sphere, but to the communal sphere. I think we, we agreed here that it is very important that this co communal or, or commons vision, whether for food or for education or for health or for energy, they, they will be extremely important in future, all these experiences of autonomy. So we need now to understand how the communal will kind of interact with the public. But I think uh, it is very important. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, Peter, do you, do you want to uh, have a crack at that? Yeah, as you very well put it, Raj, sometimes the, the only thing worse than being ignored by the government is having the government intervene in, in your affairs. And so I, I prefer to get the government, get, get government and policy on the side of banning bad things. So they should be uh, banning corporate monopolies and applying the existing anti-monopoly legislation. Uh, uh, they should be banning these illegal financial transactions that they're, that they're looking the other way to that, that Sophia mentioned. I'm, they should be banning uh, toxic pesticides. They should be banning uh, uh, co confined an intensive confined animal production. And often that people think that means we can't eat meat. But if we think about the situation in the US, uh, corporate meat companies bought local slaughterhouses around the United States and closed them. And, and the only way that you can, for example, raise a pig, slaughter it and sell it is if you produce under contract. And the only way you can get a contract is to, or, is to open a hog factory with 400,000 hogs. What that has done is excluded most family farmers in the United States from doing something that they know how to do, that they like to do, and that's very profitable for them, which is raising a few hogs and selling them. And so we could easily have the same number of hogs. 400,000 in one hog farm, one hog factory, would be 8,000 family farmers with 50 hogs each, or would be uh, 20,000 farmers with 10 hogs each. And there are way more than that just in the United States alone who've been excluded from, a bill of, of their, from being able to produce animal protein and market it. So it's because government has not applied a serious public health lens to all of the risks associated with these uh, animal uh, production farms, including water pollution and all kinds of labor abuses, and, and they need to be banned. And just by banning some of these bad things, we open up space for the other food system, the other food system that really is capable of, of creating food Thank you so much, Peter. Um, we've we've lost Alejandro. I'm, I'm not sure whether we'll be able to get him back, but uh, if in the meantime, Maisa, would you mind uh, closing us out then? Uh, yes, well, Peter and Sophia already mentioned uh, very important things. Uh, I think that uh, that is this lie that uh, we have been hearing over and over and over for many decades that uh, industrial agriculture is going to feed the world, which is not true because uh, agribusiness is responsible for the destruction of land, soil, water sources, biodiversity. And without that, of course, we cannot have productive agriculture. And also um, agribusiness together with fossil fuels is the main cause of climate change because their chemical inputs are based on fossil fuels. So without changing the food systems, we are not going to deal with the climate crisis and the food crisis and the health crisis. So we need to build diversified food systems. Uh, we need to stop the, the expansion of monocropping plantations. And uh, because this is still comes from the war economy, you know, pesticides are like chemical weapons. And uh, for example, uh, recently the Brazilian government approved over 500 new pesticides in Brazil that have been banned in other countries, in the US and Europe. So we need, for example, a global 
uh, regulation on pesticides. And uh, we need to really focus on prioritizing small food systems and diversified food systems that are much more productive and uh, can really you know, be uh, a main way of uh, stopping and dealing with the, with the huge environmental crisis that we are facing right now. Thank you so much, Maisa. Well, uh, we've, we've reached the end of our time. I'm sorry that Alejandro wasn't here to, to be able to, to close us out, but I just want to thank uh, our panelists today, uh, and uh, Peter, Sofia, and Maisa, and Alejandro in absentia. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. And uh, to hand over the mic finally back to Paloma Diaz from uh, Lila Spenson uh, to take us out. Thank you so much, Raj. On behalf of Lila Spenson, we appreciate all your comments. We have a very busy chat with many other questions that we couldn't get to, but we appreciate your time and we hope to see you again in a future event. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you all.